Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for so many people here. Thank you for our newcomers, our invitees. We pray, Lord, you open the eyes of everyone to behold wonderful things out of your word in Jesus' name. Bless our leaders, bless our pastors, bless our workers, bless our members. Everyone there today, Lord, bless us and move us forward in the study of the word in Jesus' name. And to all our brethren who are receiving by satellite, we pray that the blessings will shower upon us there. You shower upon everyone in Jesus' name. And this word will do good in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're looking at uh, John chapter 6 today. John chapter 6, looking at verse 16. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard what he had said, as the Son of God, when they heard what he had said, as the bread of life, when they heard what he had said, as the manna that came from heaven, when he heard what he told them, how they could have life, life through Christ, life through faith in him, life by taking everything that is brought to them. And then there's no other way. This is the only way. When they heard, they said, this is an hard scene. Who can hear it? Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walk no more was he from that time when they evaluated the message wrongly from that time when they misunderstood the message of christ the lord from that time uh, when they misinterpreted misapplied misused the word of god many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him what did he mean from verse 67 then said jesus to the twelve will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. If you come back to verse 60, you'll find the word disciples, many of his disciples. If you come to verse 66, you have the word disciples. From that time, many of his disciples. The question is, was a disciple. The question is, who are these people that were referred to as disciples? A disciple is a learner. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is a convert. A disciple is a person who has responded to the call of Christ to repent of all their sins and to believe on him and to labor for him. As we look at the New Testament and the Lord Jesus Christ himself used the word disciple. He said, number one, a disciple is one following the Lord who has committed himself to learn of him. He has committed himself to learn. If you're a disciple, you come to the master, you come to the teacher, you come to the Lord, you come to the Savior. And the number one thing you make up your mind to do is to learn. Number two, to love him. 
You cannot follow a person you don't love, but you own him as master. You own him as Lord. And you say, I'm going to love him. Number three is to labor for him. You're no more living for self. You're no more living for society. You're no more living for the devil. You're no more living for greed. You're living for him. Number four is to live like him. Is the master. He is the one that has called you. And you're following after him. You see what you saw. And you live the way he lives. And you do what he does, you want to live like him. If you say you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you want to, number five, live all for him. The past is gone. And everything you held dear to yourself, you live all for him. Number six is to lay down your very life for him. Is to say, I'm going to take his message, accept his message. I'm going to preach his message. I'm going to live for his message. And even if it comes to laying down my life for him, I'm a disciple, I lay down my life for him. Number seven is to labor for him. Him. You see, you say you're a disciple. It's called you so that the work he has to do, you want to do that work too. You want to be involved in that work too. Number eight is to lead others to him. To lead others to him. That's why you're a disciple. You want to tell other people he's the savior. He's the only savior. He's the redeemer. He's the only redeemer. And you want to bring other people, compel them to come in. You want to lead others to him. Him. Number nine, you want to lose all for his sake. Lose all for his sake. That is, it doesn't matter at all. Persecution may come. Difficulties may come. Challenges may come. You are a disciple. That means you are willing to lose all for his sake. Number ten is to live with him through all eternity. That's why you disciple. You follow now. You're following him now, and then till you, get, till you get to heaven with him, you are following after him because you want to live with him throughout all eternity. Look at what he says himself. We're looking at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. What did him from verse 28? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That's a disciple. is calling you to learn of him. Look at his ways and look at his life and look at everything he does and then learn. Learn how to live and learn how to glorify God and learn how to have the grace of God in your life and learn how to live in holiness and righteousness and learn about the way to heaven the highway of holiness the highway of godliness it says come learn of me we're looking at matthew chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 37 matthew chapter 10 verse 37 it says he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me he that taketh not his cross and follow it after me is not worthy of me. It's okay about discipleship there. It says you're a disciple. You love him. You love him above your very life. You love him above every human being on earth. You love him above property, above money, above any other thing. You love him beyond and above all. We're looking at John chapter 15, the disciple. And then you're asking yourself, am I a real disciple? Have I been born again? Am I a child of God? Am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Am I willing to learn everything uh, that he has to teach? And I'm be willing, am I willing to live for him? John chapter 15 verse 8. Herein uh, is my father glorified that she bear much fruit. So shall ye be my, what's the word there? My disciples as the father has loved me. So have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. The life of the disciple is a life of love. You love the master. You love his word. You love his work. You love his will. You love his people. You love his purpose. You love his practice. You love everything that the master 
identifies as important unto him. As a father has loved me, even so have I loved you, continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. There's an evidence for the disciple. If you're a real disciple of Jesus Christ, you keep the commandments of the Lord. And it says, even as I have kept my father's commandments, and abide in his love. In John chapter 13, reading from verse 15. John chapter 13, reading from verse 15. He tells us in his own words, John chapter 13, verse 15, it says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. You see that? That's the master. Telling the disciples, I've shown you an example. I've shown you the pattern. I've shown you the life to live. And what's a disciple to do? A disciple is to live like the master and live for the master. Look at verse 16 here. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than him that sent him. If ye know these things, Happier ye if ye do them will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. I said we will be doers of the word in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 33. A disciple, who is a disciple? A disciple is one who is willing to leave everything behind. Anything that contradicts, anything that goes against your discipleship. Are you following after the Lord? You say, no, I've made up my mind. I've made my choice. I'm going to follow the Lord. And I'm not going to allow anything to contradict my decision. In uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has. Forsaketh not all that he has. He cannot be my disciple. If you're going to be a disciple of the Lord, anything that contradicts the way of the Lord, the watch of the Lord, anything that contradicts the desire of the Lord, your life, anything that contradicts the doctrine of Christ, the master, the Lord, the Savior, the Redeemer, you forsake that. It says so likewise, whosoever, anybody may profess anything, I'm a disciple, I'm following after the Lord, I'm this, I'm that. But it says whosoever, he be of you that forsake seeketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 34. Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 34. It tells us in verse 34, and when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake. And for the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. It's telling us that you must be willing to lose anything and everything for his sake. That means persecution will not jolt you. Opposition will not hinder you. That means whatever people do and whatever they promise you, they say they'll give you this and give you that. If you forsake Christ, you say, no, I cannot do that. Look at that verse again. Chapter 8, verse 34. It says, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he's not going to instruct his disciples. He said unto them, whosoever, whosoever. You say you are born again, you are converted, you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, whosoever will come after me. Let him deny himself. There are things you have find pleasure in. If they contradict the life of the believer, you deny yourself of them. There are things that people will promise you. And they say they will give you this and give you that. If it contradicts your decision to follow the Lord, you continue to deny yourself. It says let him deny himself and take up his cross. There are challenges, the difficulties. There may be crises. You take up your cross and then you follow after him. And then it says for whosoever, because whosoever will save his life, whosoever will save his face, whosoever will protect himself, whosoever will say, I cannot go there, I cannot do that, because that will endanger my life, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, he shall save it. But starting six, 
For what shall it profit a man? What shall it profit a woman? What shall it profit anyone? What shall it profit a so-called worshiper? What shall it profit a so-called member of the church? What shall it profit a so-called disciple? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels and you see if you are a disciple you want to live with christ forever live with him forever we're looking at john chapter 17 and verse 24 john chapter 17 and i'm reading from verse 24 father i will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where i am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovedst me before the foundation of the world. That's the final destination, the final habitation, and the final destiny of the people who say they are disciples of Christ. So, as we look at this passage today, and we're talking about disciples, different kinds of disciples, you want to understand a disciple is to learn of him. A disciple is to love him. A disciple is to live for him. A disciple is to live like him. A disciple is to leave all for him. A disciple is to lay down his life for him. A disciple is to labor for him. A disciple is to lead others to him. A disciple is to lose all for his sake. And a disciple has decided to live with him through all eternity. The question is, would you say Looking at what we have seen today, looking at the word we have read, and looking at the words of Jesus Christ himself, would you say you are converted? You say you are born again? Would you say you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? Would you say that you are really following after the Lord? Do you measure up to the expectation of discipleship in the New Testament from the words of Jesus Christ? When did you become a disciple? How has the life of disciple played out in your life? What is the evidence of your discipleship as you look at the word of God and you compare your life with the word of God? As we come to the study today, the title is Abiding in Christ Till the End. Abiding in Christ till the end. You remember in John chapter 6 verse 67, then said Jesus to the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, abiding in Christ till the end. As we look at all the verses we have read, that is verse 60, all through to verse 71, we are dividing these to three parts. Number one, the shallowness of carnal backsliders. The shallowness of Canal backsliders. Point number two, the steadfastness of consecrated believers. Those who say there's no other thing to do. There's no other place to go. There's no other redeemer to search for. And there's no other Messiah to seek. Here is the Savior. Here is the Lord. And it was steadfast. The steadfastness of consecrated believers. Number three, the self-centeredness of a condemned betrayer. The self-centeredness of a condemned betrayer. We're coming to number one. In number one, the shallowness of carnal backsliders. We're coming back to chapter six of John. John chapter six, and I'm reading from verse 16. It says, many therefore of his disciples, when they had this said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? You understand what they were saying? They didn't understand the basic principle of master-servant. 
the, bis the basic principle of teacher student. They need to understand the basic principle of captain follower. What do you understand about teacher student? A teacher should know more than a student. What do you understand about a master servant? A master should know more than the servant. And what do you understand about a captain and a follower? A captain should know more than the follower. And they should understand that if Jesus Christ was master and he was master, he, if he was Lord and he is Lord, if he was their savior, redeemer, if he actually came from heaven, they were people of earth and they were people of yesterday. Here is the one that had been from all eternity. He should know things they didn't know. He could say things they didn't understand. All they needed to do was to say, Oh Lord, that's high above us. Can you explain to us? That deep beyond us. Can you explain to us? That's a mystery. We don't understand that. We're people of yesterday. We're natural people. And we just came into the kingdom. These deep mysteries of the kingdom, we don't understand. And these high great teachings of the kingdom, we need to understand. Explain unto us. That's what they should have done. But they just said, this is an hard saying. Of course. This is a deep saying, of course, and this is higher than what we ever had before, of course. All they should say is, we don't understand, please say teachers, but look at this in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back. You know the meaning of that? It's like a student saying, uh, if the teacher is going to say something I didn't understand, at uh, the first time he mentions it, I'm going to get out of school. That would be foolish. If a person says, if my master says anything I don't understand, at the first point he mentioned that and he called me to it, then I'm going to go away. You're an apprentice. The person you're doing apprenticeship under will know more than you know. And therefore, if he says anything or does anything or leads a particular way you don't understand, you don't go back. You say, I'm here to learn and I'm here to look at him. I'm here to see his life. I'm here to hear his message. I'm and whatever he's teaching me, if I don't understand now, he might say it again tomorrow and say it again the other day and say it again the next time. And eventually, I will understand. You will understand. But you see these people, they were carnal. It says from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked no more. We're saying 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 14. Here it tells us, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Compare Jesus Christ with those disciples. They were natural. Compare Jesus Christ with those disciples. Jesus Christ, a teacher come from heaven. Jesus Christ, supernatural. Jesus Christ is the personification of truth. Jesus Christ, the word that was with God. And the word that was God. And the word that became a flesh and dwelt among us. They were just natural people. They didn't understand. And because they didn't understand, they saw the distance between them and the master. They saw the height between them and the master and because of that lack of understanding they decided to go back i pray you'll not go back look at verse 14 again here it says but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they're spiritually designed in a second peter second peter chapter 3, you understand it wasn't only Jesus alone that says something that people could not understand at the first mention. Every teacher does that. If you look at, uh, you know, the teachers of the word of God and the ministers of the gospel you are going to find, they might say something you don't understand at the first time they said it. And sometimes they mention some words you don't understand. What's the meaning of that? I don't understand that. If Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Eventually you will understand. But look at this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. It says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood. 
It may happen. You can come to the Bible study. You may come to the service and you hear something you cannot understand or you didn't understand at the first mention. That shouldn't set you to go back and that shouldn't drive you back. It's just that, well, at my stage today, at my level today, I don't understand that, but I know if I keep on coming and if I pray, the spirit of truth will guide me into all truth. And it says over here that Paul the Apostle in some things that, that he wrote had to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, they twist, they distort, as they do also other scriptures unto their own destruction. The people who went back because they didn't understand, that was to their own destruction. I pray you'll not be destroyed. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say. We're talking about Christ. We have many things to say. We've learned about him. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. Is the Lamb of God, is the light of the world, is the wisdom of God, is the word of God, is the power of God, and he is the authority and the anointed from the Lord. He is the Redeemer, the Savior, the Lord, the Master, the Messiah. He is the only way, is the cornerstone. And it says, even though we've said all that, we still have many things to say of him. Look at that verse 11. Hard to be uttered. Art to be uttered, seen ye are dull of hearing. You see, there are some people, if they hear anything that we've well, been coming to church, we didn't hear that for one year, we didn't hear for that for five years, and we're hearing that and that is no, no, that cannot be. That cannot be. Whatever I have not learned in 10 years, I cannot learn again. Whatever I've not learned in 20 years, I cannot learn again. Whatever I've not heard, I've been coming to the church for all these many years. Anything I hear now that doesn't feet into what I had before. I just throw everything away. Those are shallow disciples. Those are people that do not understand that the word of God is so deep and so high and so broad and so great that there's so much for us to learn. That's why he's saying over here of whom we still have many things to say and had to be understood and to be uttered. Seen ye are dull of hearing for when for the time Ye ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. There's meat, there's milk. And I pray that the Lord will make you graduate out of the milk to the meat in Jesus' name. This is what these people could not do. And look at what they did now. We're coming back to John. Coming back to John. Look at their reaction. And look at uh, their attitude. And look at their decision after they had something. In that said, we didn't hear that before. We didn't know that before. This and had seen who can endure this, who can understand this, who can follow this, who can obey this, who can hear this. In verse 66, for from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. When it says they went back, what's the meaning of that? They went back from the light of the world to the darkness in the world. What's the meaning of that? They went back from the Savior to their sin. What's the meaning of that? They went back to the one that came to take them to heaven. And they went back to the one that will lead them to hell. They went back. When somebody goes back like that, he doesn't remain in the same spiritual state he was before. In uh, Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs going back. Look at the meaning of that. Look at the implication of that. Look at the consequence of that in Proverbs chapter 21 verse 16. So important. Open your Bible. Proverbs chapter 21. Tell me the verse. Verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. They left the source of life, Jesus Christ, and they went back to death, spiritual death. Now they were dead again in trespasses and sins. Now they were dead spiritually. And if they died in that condition, where would they spend eternity? 
hellfire we're looking at uh, luke chapter 9 luke chapter 9 uh, verse 62 luke chapter 9 uh, verse 62 you see coming to church is not enough you see just saying i'm a disciple that's not enough when you hear the word of god you hear something beyond salvation you hear something uh, beyond the initial grace you hear something beyond the abc of the gospel and then you are hearing about holiness without which no man shall see the lord you say do i understand that do i want to accept that do i want to follow that and because you hear about holiness then you say you go back you go back to the congregation of the dead we're looking at luke chapter 9 verse 62 luke chapter 9 verse 62 jesus said unto him who said this i said who said this Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his son to the plow, and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. There are people who think, well, I made a profession before, I raised up my hand before, and I'm following after the Lord. Whatever I do now doesn't matter. Of course it matters. It matters. It says, No man, having put his son to the plow, and looking back, even looking back, not to talk of sliding back, not to talk of going back, not to talk of acting now, contrary to the faith you once professed, looking back, you're no more fit for the kingdom of God. Thank God you will not go back. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Now the just shall live by faith. That's what Jesus was calling those people to. He said, you must uh, take me as the provider of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the manna that has come from heaven. That if a man takes of me, he will live forever. All they need to do is to believe that. Believe that Jesus is your only savior. Believe Jesus is the one that will take you from where you are and take you to heaven. Now they just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back unto what? Tell me out loud. Unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Those who draw back, they draw back to darkness. They draw back to perdition. They draw back to eternal judgment. All those disciples who went back, they went back from the Lord. They went back from the Savior. They went back from heaven. And eventually, that will mean hell for them. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you understand this? These are people who have been saved. These were people who were converted. These were people that came into the grace of God. They escaped the pollutions of the world. They escaped all the defilement of the world. That means they were converted through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, it says, they are again entangled therein. They came out of the world. They are again entangled in the world. They came out of the defilement of the world. They are again entangled in the defilements of the world. They came out of all those bad practices of the world because they were saved, because they were converted, because they had new life. And they went back entangled again in all those evil practices of the world. And they overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. When somebody backslides, is that a better lie? Tell me. No, it's worse. Worse. Worse condition than they were before. Look at this in verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. The holy commandments were delivered unto them. At the beginning, they accepted, they embraced, they followed. They said, this is what I'm going to live for. But now later, because of temptation, because of trial, and because of lack of understanding, they go back, but it has happened unto them. According to the true proverb, 
the dog is turned to his vomit again, and the soul that, that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. You will not turn back. Look at one man here in Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 10. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Look at such a man in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed unto Thessalonica. And if any man be a friend of the world, what does he become? Tell me out loud. An enemy of God. You see there are people in their earlier years of the faith. They followed after the Lord. And all the things of the world. All the festivals of the world. All the idolatry of the world. All the pollutions of the world. They forsook. They said I'm going to follow the Lord. Like demons. They go back to that world again. Loving this present evil world. And they become the enemies of God. They were not stable. They were shallow. They were not solid. They were shallow. And they didn't give themselves fully to walking after the ways of the Lord. And if they remain in that condition, they'll be lost forever. I pray you'll not be lost forever. We're reading from Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 11. We're reading from verse 22. Romans 11 verse 22. It says in verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. It says there are two sides of God. The goodness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, and the favor of God. There's the other side of God, the wrath of God. The severity of God, the judgment of God, the indignation of God on them which fell, tell me the word. On them which, which fell, tell me the word. Severity, those who go back. Those who say they cannot follow anymore. Because of a little challenge, they go back. Because of a little misunderstanding of a single sentence in a message, they said, is that so? Then I cannot follow. And because of a little thing, that is, that's a hard saying. Who can receive that? Who can obey that? Then they will not follow on them that fail severity. But toward thee goodness, if thou Continue in his goodness. Toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, tell me the rest. Otherwise, tell me out loud. I shall be caught off. I pray you'll not be caught off. The disciples found the teaching of the master hard to understand. They found the teaching of the master hard to believe and hard to obey. They should have thought of what they already knew and already understood. And they could have asked the master teacher for clarification. If you don't understand anything, you'll ask for clarification. You'll ask for explanation. You'll ask for more instruction. They should have thought of eternity. They should have thought of their destiny. They should have thought of the consequence of their decision. But to see many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They went back to their old life. They went back to their old religion. They went back to darkness. They went back to doom. They went back to damnation. They were lost. They perished. They went to hell. And at this time, we're talking about them. After hundreds and thousands of years, they're still in hell now. I pray you will not go back. We're coming back to John. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're reading now from verse 67, point number two. The steadfastness of consecrated believers. These were real believers. Thank God you'll be like these believers. Look at verse 67. Jesus said, and then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure. Look at that. Peter said, we believe. Not only that, we're sure beyond any shadow of doubt that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. And then said Jesus unto them, have I not chosen you twelve? He told them, have I not chosen you twelve? Christ had taught the truth. The absolute truth. 
And then uh, the truth, this is the truth from heaven. Many rejected the truth and many left him. He did not change the truth to accommodate those people that didn't want to remain in the truth. You see, there are some preachers, if they tell the truth, and then people did not come to church the following Sunday, or they said, hey, that truth they can't accept, they don't want to accept. In fact, I've heard of preachers that will come back to the pulpit and apologize, apologize for the word of God, for saying, without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. They come back to apologize. To say, they come back to apologize to say, uh, the, the person that is born again does not commit sin and that whosoever committed sin is of the devil. They read him from the word of God and people misunderstand that and therefore they come back to apologize but Jesus did not apologize for the truth. You upheld the truth. You uphold the truth. I said, you know, pull the truth. Uh, there are some people, they will resist the truth, reject the truth, oppose the truth, criticize the truth. They'll misbehave and they will react against the preacher because of the truth. And those preachers will then begin to wobble and they begin to change. They begin to say, well, I'm sorry. I said that. I'm sorry. I preached that. What are you sorry about? That's the only truth that can take people to heaven. That's the only truth that can keep people in the kingdom of of God. If we change the truth, what remains is error. Because truth changed becomes error. And error cannot take anybody to heaven. And so if you change the truth because some people left, you pollute the truth and you pollute the way of salvation for the people that are remaining. And the people who are remaining to you cannot get to heaven because they are not hearing the truth from you anymore. And when Jesus said, Will you also go away so that, uh, because we have to retain the truth. If it's only eight people in the whole world of Noah that get saved, we must retain the absolute truth. If it's only two people out of 600,000 of the children of Israel that get to the land of Canaan, we still have to abide by the truth. And we cannot say because many people are not accepting what they want now is prosperity. What they want now is healing. What they want now is uh, children. What they want now is miracle. What they want now is this and that. They're not thinking of salvation anymore. They're not thinking you know, of eternal life anymore. They're not thinking of getting to heaven anymore. And because they're not thinking of that, all they want is this. All they want is that. Give them what they want. If you give them what they want and then you hold back on the word of eternal life, it means all will be lost. Everybody will be lost. Even the people that want to get to heaven, they cannot get to heaven because nobody is showing them the truth or telling them the truth will abide in the truth. I said we're going to abide in the truth because it is that truth that gets people to heaven. Change the truth and give them error. Change the truth and give them falsehood. Change the truth and give them false doctrine. Change the truth and then everybody will miss the way that gets to heaven. But if you're interested, the people will get to heaven. If you're interested, the people will keep on standing steadfast in the word of God, in the will of God and get to heaven. You are by that absolute truth without taking away from it, without adding onto it. So the people will be able to believe on something that is solid, on something that is stable, on something that is steadfast, and then they'll go on their way to heaven. And here Peter said, we believe and we're sure, not just that we believe, we're sure beyond any shadow of doubt that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, you're the Savior. There's no other person to go to, and there's no other name to call. You are the one that leads us to life eternal, and we're going to keep on following. I pray you'll be of that mind, and you will follow until the very end in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 73. Psalm 73. I'm reading from verse 25. Whom, shall, whom, shall, whom have I in heaven? Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Here you find the confession of the psalmist. Here you find the face of the psalmist. He too was saying, uh, there's no other person on earth, no other person in heaven that we desire, that we can follow. Here is the only savior. Here is the only truth personified. And here is the one that leads us to life eternal. And we will follow him to the very end in Jesus. 
Jesus name. We're looking at Job chapter 17 verse 9. Job chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. The righteous also shall hold on his way. Are you sure of anything? Do you believe anything? Peter said we know, we're sure and we believe that thou art the Christ. Do you believe that? That thou art the Savior. Do you believe that? That you are the only way that leads to heaven. Do you believe that? That there's no other way, there's no other person, no other name given among men whereby we can be saved. Do you believe that? It says the righteous also shall hold on his way and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. You'll not be weaker and weaker. You know, people who are strong, you know, last year, but now they're weak this year. People that had knowledge last year, and now it's like all their knowledge is gone. The people that had commitment in the previous years, it's like all their convictions are gone. But here, the one that is righteous and the one a pilgrim to heaven, a person really wants to get to heaven, he says he'll have clean hands and he'll be stronger and stronger. He'll not meddle with people that are given to change, that are wobbling. You know, the people today, they lean this side, tomorrow they lean that side. If prosperity preachers come, they say, okay, prosperity, that's the thing now. If a healing comes, that's the only thing now. Deliverance, that's the only thing now. Territorial spirit, that's the only thing now. But they, they forsake the way of salvation, and they forsake the way of the truth, and they'll be carrying some books or prayer about, and check up those things. They don't have any value in them. There's no substance in them, and there's no truth eternal truth in them that will take somebody to heaven. I pray the Lord will deliver us from all that in Jesus' name. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 21. Proverbs chapter 24 from verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King and meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. You might meet some people and say, ah, I will not be seeing you again at a fellowship, at a Bible study in the church. Oh, it says, well, you know, uh, I used to believe this, I used to believe that, just like what you are believing now. But you know, I've gone further. What do you mean by going further? Further than Christ? What do you mean by going further? Further than holiness? What do you mean by going further? Further than sanctification? I've gone away from all that. You've gone away from the truth. And if you're a child of God, you're trying to help them, to make them see the light, and to bring them back. But if they will not come back, you will not meddle with them. You will not stay with them. And they will not pull you back into evil in Jesus' name. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. Are you there? Proverbs 23, verse 23. Everybody, one, two, three, go. Say that again. Final time. Buy the truth and sell it not. It's the truth that leads us to heaven. There's the truth that keeps us in Christ. There's the truth that keeps us in fellowship with the Lord. Buy the truth and sell it not. Don't allow anything to take this truth away from your hand. Now, if you're going to keep the truth, if you're going to keep to the truth, you need an experience. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. You see, the people who are not able to abide, they're the people, they have some kind of superficial testimony. I was saved. I gave my life to the Lord. I was a child of God. This happened to me. That happened to me. But you see, they don't, they don't have a kind of st stabilizing experience that from the depths of their heart, there's a root. The root of sin had been taken away. And the root of righteousness, of sanctification, and the root of the nature of Christ have been implanted in them that no matter the wind that blows, they will not be blown away. You need that experience. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. Reading from verse 39. It says in verse 39, And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me, how long? Forever. 
It says, I'll give them such a heart. I'll give them such a way. I'll give them such an experience that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. What kind of covenant? everlasting covenant of them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts. Tell me the rest. I will put my fear in their hearts. Tell me the rest. That they shall not depart from me. You see, these people that left Christ, they didn't have that experience. They didn't have this second work of grace in them that would make them to be steadfast in the Lord. But you know, the people who really believed in the Lord and is stood for righteousness, they had the grace of God in them and they were steadfast. You'll be steadfast. We're reading from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 42. Acts chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Let's back up to verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, forgiveness, cleansing of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord our god shall call and with many other words did he testify and exhort say save yourselves from this unto our generation he told them what to repent of he told them to come out of that uh, evil society and to, to kind of abandon all their pollutions and all their practices. It says with many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, uh, save yourself from this unto our generation. Look at verse 41. Then um, did that, how did they receive the word? No complaint, no murmuring. And no criticism. Uh, I can't understand that. This and hard sin. They that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them. How many? About 3,000 souls. Look at verse 42. And they. Tell me. Tell me out loud. Tell me as if that's what you are going to do. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Not in the apostles' meal. Not in the apostles' eating. Not in the apostles' festivals. Not in the apostles' entertainment. What did they continue in? Tell me out loud. Apostles' doctrine. Doctrine. The teaching of the word of God. is the teaching that gives backbone. It's the teaching that makes you strong. It's the teaching that shows what kind of person you are, what kind of convert you are, what kind of disciple you are. It's the teaching that shows, the doctrine that shows what kind of follower you are. And it says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, after the doctrine of fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. I pray you'll continue in Jesus' name. Chapter 11, chapter 11 of Acts. Acts chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 21. Acts 11, we're reading from verse 21. It says, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. You see these people, they turned unto the Lord. They turned from darkness, they turned to the light. They turned from righteousness, they turned to righteousness. They turn from all the defilement of their lives and they turn to clean life. If any man be in Christ, a new creature, old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Look at verse 22. Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And the saint fought Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Look at verse 23. And who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, we can see the grace of God with your new language, your new life, your new appearance, your new lifestyle, your new character, your new behavior, your gracious life now. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that were purpose of heart, what will they do? 
they will cleave unto the Lord. With purpose of heart, they will what? Cleave unto the Lord. We're coming to chapter 13 of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 43. Acts 13, verse 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious persons followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. You need to continue. That's how to retain that salvation. That's how to retain that sanctification. That's how to be ready and prepared for the rapture, to continue in the grace of God. Chapter 14, Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 14, reading from verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to, to do what? To continue in the faith. Continue in the faith. And there's no joy in coming in and then going back. There's no joy in believing and then backsliding. There's no joy in following the Lord and then falling away. It says confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You will enter the kingdom. 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, meditate upon these things. What does that mean? All that you are hearing at the Bible study, all that you are hearing at the fellowship, it says you meditate upon these things and you give yourself, what's the next word? Holy unto them, wholeheartedly unto them, or reservedly unto them, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you commit yourself to the word you're hearing, so that there's a decision, there's a determination, there's a diligence. Say, I'm never going to go back from these. It says, meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and to, unto the doctrine. What's the next? Next word. I said, What's the next word? I will continue. I can't hear you. I will continue. You'll continue in Jesus' name. When you see other people sliding back, you will continue. You see other people deny the faith, you'll continue. When you see other people at the time of marriage, you want to get married now. And because of that, they forget everything they have learned for 10 years, for 15 years. I pray you'll continue in Jesus' name. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. We're coming back to this in uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we're looking at those words of uh, Peter. John chapter 6. Reading from the words of Peter, that is in verse 69, we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was sure and was saved. He was saved and was sure. He was decided, he was fully resolved. He believed and he bound himself unto the Lord. By the, by the courts of love. And he was not only just a bound to him alone, but to all the others. They were settled and they were steadfast. They were fixed and they were focused. They were firm, they were immovable. Firm and immovable. That whatever, you've made up your mind. Whatever, you've taken your decision. Whatever, you feel that salvation within you. Whatever, you know the grace of God within you. And you're saying, whatever happens, I am saved. I'm sure about it. I'm steadfast. I'm single-minded. I'm consecrated. I'm sanctified. I am holy. I'm focused on heaven. I am giving to the Lord, and I'm not going to allow any unfaithful friend, unfaithful acquaintance, unfaithful backslider, unfaithful person around me to get me back. I'll follow the Lord, no going back, no turning back. Give me a good amen. amen. Point number three now, the self-centeredness of a condemned betrayer. The self-centeredness 
of a condemned betrayer. We're reading from chapter 6, verses 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Understand that. Have not I chosen you twelve? It is uh, not I chosen you eleven. Have not cho have I not chosen you all of you twelve? Judas is carried included. He chose also Judas is carried. He converted also Judas is carried. He saved also Judas is carried. He forgave also Judas is carried. Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you, Judas is carried, became an adversary became a backslider, became a devil. And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he for it was he that shall betray him, being, tell me, one of the twelve. You see this Judas Iscariot, many people don't understand. He was saved. He was saved. Uh, look at uh, chapter 10 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 and I'm reading from verse 1. Matthew chapter 10 from verse 1. And when he had called his, how many disciples? Twelve disciples. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And now these are the names of the twelve apostles. He goes on to mention them, and you'll find Judas is carried out there. You know, Jesus said, Give not that which is holy unto dogs. And if Judas is carried out, was not born again at this time, was not converted at this time, was not a true follower at this time, will not have given the power to him like he gave all the other people. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, behold, I send you forth as what? A sheep in the midst of wolves. That means uh, this uh, Judas has got among the twelve. He sent him forth for them to a sheep um, in the midst of the wolves. He says, Now be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We're coming to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're reading from verse 7. And he called unto him, Mark chapter, chapter what? Verse what? Are you there? I'm going to ask you a question. That's what I'm asking. I said, are you there? And he called unto him. How many of them? The twelve. The twelve. That is, Judas is carried out, included. And began to send them forth by two and two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. Look at verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. They went out. Was Judas there? Yeah. I said, was he there? How can Jesus send somebody who had not repented to tell other people to repent? No, he cannot do that. Because Jesus himself said, if the blind lead the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch. He had repented at this time. And therefore, Jesus sent them, all the twelve, that they should preach that men should repent. But something happened. He was the treasurer of the team. He carried the bag. And something began to happen little by little by little. You see, sin comes in little by little. Hypocrisy comes in little by little. Unfaithfulness comes in little by little. Backsliding begins in a slight way. And eventually, after backsliding and backsliding and backsliding, terrible things begin to happen. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4. John chapter 12 from verse 4. Then says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who shall betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This, he said, listen to this, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was, because he was, was he a thief from the beginning? No. The Lord had sent him out to tell others to repent. He himself had repented. He was a disciple. He was a follower. 
He was saved. He was a convert. But now he was a thief and at the bag and bear what was put therein. Covetousness came in. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. We're reading from verse 21. I pray you'll not backslide. Amen. You'll not become a Judas Iscariot. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. Reading from verse 21. Matthew 26, verse 21. And as they, as they did each, he said, But he I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Look up here for a moment. Jesus said, one of you twelve will betray me. If he was a person that wasn't converted and all the eleven knew, they look his direction, they said, that's the man. If he was a man, when they went out, the twelve of them went out, and everywhere they preached healing, and they preached deliverance, and they preached repentance, and people repented, and many people were healed. If he was the only one that couldn't heal the sick, they said, that's the man, it's carnal, that's the man, it's always been like that, that's the man, he doesn't have spirituality. Nobody knew that it was him, because his life was like them. His life was like their own. And everything appeared uniform and direct. And they said, is it I? Look at verse 23. And he, say, and he answered and said, He that deepeth his hand with me in the ditch, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. And it, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Eventually when Judas died, where did he go? Tell me out loud. Hell. Because it had been good if he had not been born. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 14, verse 10. Mark chapter 14, we're reading from verse 10. In Mark chapter 14, verse 10, open your Bible, Mark chapter 14, verse 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, what did he do? Went unto the chief priest to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad. They were not looking for him. He was the one looking for them. Because he was saying, if you are going to promise to give me money, I can betray him to you. And promise to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Eventually, when he was having the thought in him, the devil then came in to assist him. He was having the thought, I want to do this, I want to get the money, and the devil came to assist him. I pray the devil will not assist you to do evil. Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Luke chapter 22, what's the verse? Okay, read it for me then. Uh-huh, you have not opened your Bible. Luke chapter 22, verse 3, 1, 2, 3, go. Then entered Satan into Judah, so named Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way, and he committed the, with the, if he communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad. And he covenanted to give him money. And he promised and he sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the, press, in the absence of the multitude. We're coming to John chapter 13. John Chapter 13, I pray the spirit of Judas Iscariot will not be upon you. You'll not be a betrayer. You'll not be a backslider. You'll stand on the word of God. And you'll be consistent until the very end in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 2. John chapter 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, 
the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. You see the involvement of the devil, of Satan there? The devil put the idea in his mind. He didn't resist the devil. He didn't reject the devil. Because this will give him what he wanted. He's always been looking for more money, more money, more money. Wherever it came from. And in whatever form it will come. And the opportunity now came. And because of that, he yielded to the devil. You will not yield to the devil. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas and Scariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And then it goes on and on. Look at verse 30 here. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. And eventually, he did it. You will not do it. I said you will not do it. And eventually, he regretted that he did it. At the time, he was doing it when the temptation was strong. He didn't remember the judgment that will come. He didn't remember the calamity that will come. He didn't remember the doom, the damnation, the destiny. But now, after doing it, we're looking at Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him... When he saw that he was condemned, he repented himself. That means he regretted. This not repentance in the sense of turning away from sin, having deep sorrow for sin, and not wanting to go to hell, and seeking the face of the Lord for, for grace and for mercy and for restoration. He repented, regretted himself. And he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed. What kind of blood? Innocent blood. And he said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went. And he went. Tell me out loud. And he went and hanged himself. He didn't have peace. Peace comes with salvation. Restoration will bring peace. He didn't have pardon. Pardon will not make a person to, if you know you are forgiven, you say, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. You didn't have the grace. You didn't have the restoration. You didn't have the peace of God. You didn't have the mercy of God. You didn't have the witness of the Spirit. He knew he was lost. He went and he hanged himself. But how did that all happen? Is it that God forced him to do that? No, not at all. Jesus warned him. But you will not listen. I pray when the warning of the Lord is coming to you, you will listen in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 25. Acts, chapter 1, verse 25. Acts, chapter 1, reading from verse 25. And that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas... Tell me, by transgression fell, by transgression fell. It was his transgression that made him to fall, that he might go to his own place. Think about Judas Iscariot, self-centered, condemned, betrayer. As we talk about Judas Iscariot in conclusion, and I pray you'll not be like this. I said you'll not be like this. An apostle who became an apostate. An ambassador who became an antichrist. A believer who became a betrayer. A convert who became covetous. A disciple who became devilish. An externally righteous follower who was extremely rotten on the inside. It was a friend who became a fool. It was a man that fell from grace to grass. You will not fall. It was heaven's candidate. In fact, Jesus said, you'll see it on the 12 thrones of Israel, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He was a candidate for heaven. He became a captive of hell. He forsook Jesus. 
to face judgment. He was instructed, but was incorrigible. The Lord told him, he said, it were better that man were not born. The Lord instructed him, don't do that. If you do that, there's going to be perdition. He was incorrigible. He was uh, the king's acquaintance, deep in his sand in the same place where the Lord Jesus Christ who became a kissing adversary. He kissed the Lord to betray him because the love of the master had gone away from him. He had the love of money. He became a leader. A leader who became lost. Leading other people to the kingdom, he himself became lost. A minister who replaced the love of his master or the love of mammon. A negotiator at the price of perdition. He negotiated his own perdition. Negotiated his own lostness. An, opportunity, an opportunist who became obstinate. Always looking for opportunity to get more money, more money, more money. Eventually, he became so obstinate, the Lord said, this way you are going is dangerous. He had gone too far. I pray you'll not go beyond the day of grace. A preacher who became a pervert. He was a preacher. He also went out with other people and he preached, but he became perverted. Have you noticed that you never hear much about Judas Iscariot? He was a quiet fellow, but a, of a questionable character. Quiet, so quiet that when the Lord said, one of you will betray me. They said, is it I? Did he say, is it him? Is it him? Because nobody suspected him. A quiet character but questionable character. Here was a reaper who became a reprobate. I send you out to reap where you have not toiled. And then I send you to reap and gather to life eternal. A reaper became a reprobate. A schemer who sold his soul to Satan. A schemer, scheming. I'll get this. I'll get. There are people like that in the church. Instead of praying and getting this root of sin out of them, getting saved, getting sanctified, getting pure, and getting so transparent, they get to heaven, they're scheming. But this was a schemer who sold the soul to Satan. A teacher who became treacherous, teaching the word of God. Eventually, he became treacherous. He was used to become of no use. The Pharisees used him to get Jesus. The religious people used him to get Jesus. Those who wanted to capture Jesus and those who wanted to kill Jesus, they used him to get Jesus. And eventually when he came back and he threw the money down and said, well, I betrayed innocent blood. No, that's, that's your business. Go and do whatever you want. He threw it down. Then he became of no use to himself, no use to life. He was used by those people and then he became of no use. And it is, uh, there are characters we call vultures. The characters we call vultures are the people that you know, they gorge, they take, they take every time. I don't know when they want to stop. They're so greedy. Here was a vulture who violated his own vow. A watchman who became a wolf. It should have been a watchman. I've set you a watchman to over the house of Israel and go tell them this is the way of the Lord. But this watchman became a wolf. It was exalted, exalted to great opportunity. It was expelled from paradise. Yoked to Satan after yielding to the Savior. He had yielded his life to the Savior. He had said, I'll follow you. No turning back, no turning back. He didn't carry through. He didn't go through because he became yoked to the devil eventually. You know why? It was zealous for money. Zealous for money. Zealous for money. His zeal was for money. He was zero in ministry. He abandoned the ministry. He didn't want the ministry anymore. All he was looking for now, zealous for money. What can I get? What can I get? Look at your life. The warning came to him, but rejected. 
And the one here comes to every one of you, every one of us. It says, he that thinketh and standeth, let him take heed. Tell me, lest he fall. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, zealous for money, but zero for ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, wherefore, let him that thinketh and standeth, take heed. Take heed, lest they fall. I pray you will not fall. In John chapter 6, we've read, we've studied about the shallow believers, backsliders. We've heard about the consecrated believers and now about the condemned betrayer. You make your choice to be a backslider, to be a believer, to be a betrayer, to be somebody who is saved. And who keeps on standing, who is steadfast to the very end, or for the, to the person who today is believing, but tomorrow you cannot find them again. And the Lord is asking you the question like he asked the twelve. Jesus said unto them, will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered, and I answer, and you answer, and we answer, Lord, Lord. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And I believe. I thought you'll say that. And I'm sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll follow the Lord. I will not go back. I said I'm following the Lord. I will not go back. I'll keep on following the Lord. I will not go back. You will not go back in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord. Commit your life to the Lord today. And say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I'll follow the Lord. I will not go back. Will you also go away? To whom shall we go? Thou were sure and were certain. We believe. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you sanctified? Are you holy? Are you committed? Have you made up your mind? You are following the Lord. You will not go back. Open your mouth and make a recommitment of your life unto the Lord.